and welcome to all those members of the Mintrish community watching out there. A uh, little bit different to our usual school visits as an athlete, but hopefully um, I can give you a bit of insight into what I do um, and hopefully give you some little training tips and some fun games that will help you get out there, get active and get doing some of the sports that you love. So I'll start off with just a little bit about me um, what I do. Um, I am a Paralympic athlete, um, currently competing in athletics and para canoe. Um, very lucky for doing, doing both. Um, however, I'm very new to para canoe. I'm only um, a year and a half into that career, um, mainly started through athletics. You may wonder, I said about Paralympics, um, what um, my disability is. So I was born with a condition called talipes, um, which essentially my foot, uh, instead of a normal position, was kind of tucked under and facing backwards. And I had a few operations, a few different uh, processes trying to straighten out my foot, um, all before the age of three, and eventually they kind of operated, uh, moved it around and fixed it in a position. And um, essentially my ankle is fused, um, so my ankle can't move at all. So those of you that kind of point your toes, I can't kind of show you. I've got a kind of skinny ankle as well. Um, that's because of the movement up and down of your foot called plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Um, doesn't happen in my foot because it doesn't move, but I um, don't build up any muscle because of that. So I mentioned I compete in athletics and um, para canoe. My disability classifies me in, in, in different classifications in each sport. Those classifications are basically categories that what you're put into depending on what your, what your disability is. Um, in athletics, there are a huge range of um, different categories and they start with a T or an F. T is for track and F is for field. Um, and then they have loads of different numbers after them. I'm in the 40s category, so I am a T44. All the 40s are for different limb deficiencies. Um, so that might range from dwarfism to arm amputees to leg amputees, which the 40s and the 60s are now combined. Um, amputees have moved um, to a 60s. Um, but for making things simple, um, it's all for different limb deficiencies. Mine category is T44. So that means I have one leg affected below the knee. Um, so I actually also compete against amputees, um, people that might have dropped foot, um, where their foot just kind of doesn't lift up properly, um, but mainly amputees, people with ankle fusions and anything equivalent to that. In the para canoe section, I am a KL3 woman. Um, so the K is for kayak. So I'm in a boat which has um, a paddle on both sides. So a canoe is paddle on one side and a kayak is a paddle on both sides. So I paddle alternate sides. Um, and the, LS, the three, sorry, is for um, different categories. So we have one, two and a three. The one is the most severe um, kind of impairment. So a lot of spinal injuries um, through mid back. Um, the number two is for both legs affected or the bottom of the spine. And for three is for leg amputations or lower limb deficiencies. So that is why I'm a KL3 woman. In both events, in the kayak, I um, do a 200 meter sprint. It is a straight line. Uh, you have nine lanes of athletes and it is the first person to finish past that finish line. Very similar to athletics. I compete in the 100 and the 200 meters. And um, so the 100 meters is a complete straight line and the 200 meters is one bend and straight through to the finish line. position, fortunate position, um, that through taking different opportunities, through being in the right place in the right time, through loving sport and trying my hardest to train, that I have, um, can now say that I've competed for my country internationally in three different sports, um, one able-bodied sport and two um, disabled um, sports as a para-athlete. Um, my first sport and my first love was hockey. Um, I loved all different kinds of sports growing up. 
I love different sports at primary school, but my school didn't do hockey. Um, but I kind of went to different clubs here, there and everywhere and tried it out. It was only when I got to secondary school that I kind of got introduced to the sport that my school did and they got us to try it out when we first started in year seven. And I just loved it. I loved every sport. I've always loved watching sports, talking about sports. Um, but hockey was the one that I really grew a love of and I got it. And I just understood the game and I really enjoyed it. Um, Unfortunately, I also um, always grew up doing loads of horse riding and my first week into year seven life at my first secondary school, I was riding a horse and it fell over and I broke my leg. Um, so I missed that whole, I was in a cast up until Christmas um, and I thought I'd missed that opportunity um, to play hockey. So I was a bit scared of putting myself out there again and trying to get into the team because I kind of thought everyone's already in their teams, they're already set, they're everyone's friends on the team. Um, and it was only in year eight, uh, my second year at school, that when we came onto the hockey term again in September, that um, a geography teacher called Mr. Scott, who was also deputy head at the school, but he was very passionate about hockey, was telling me about why didn't I get back into hockey and he was encouraging me to give it a go again. And I realised I probably, I probably should. And if he said that I was quite good and he believed in me, then why shouldn't I give it a go? And I did. I decided I was a defender to try because there wasn't many defenders in the team. So I thought that would be my way in. And I did. I managed to get into the under 40, um, under 12, I think it was at year eight, under 12, under 13 uh, C team. And um, again, found my love for it again. And I worked my way up because I love the sport, because I try really hard at it and because I understood it. I worked my way up to the ranks quite quickly and kind of got into the B team and then got in the A team by the end of year eight. And again, I found, found this love for the sport and um, played all different sports at school, tried everything. Um, again, this whole way through secondary school, I didn't know that my foot, my disability meant that I probably shouldn't be able to do certain things. But because I'd grown up just being stubborn and doing them anyway, it's, it, the rest of my body's adapted really well. Um, as I say, I then found this love for hockey and I developed got better and better throughout throughout the years and worked my way up to county the year afterwards um, and then into what played for the East of England team at under 15 level so kind of year 10 um, and then at that tournament uh, there was coaches from all the home nations from England, Ireland, um, Scotland and Wales um, kind of scouting and they knew that I had a Welsh father and I got asked to go out and try for Wales and um, I thought, yeah, why? Well, I've been a little bit of a kind of obsession with saying yes to opportunities. And sometimes they don't pay off, sometimes, um, sometimes they do pay off. And sometimes I just learn good lessons from them. However, this one did pay off. And um, so again, I worked my way up from under 15s, East of England to then um, under 16s, under 17s playing for Wales. And I worked my way up through the under 18 ranks uh, into under 21s and eventually into the senior team at the age I think of around of around 21, 2021. And so I thought this was this was my career. I loved hockey and um I went through uni playing hockey um but there was no kind of you can't make a career out of it full time because unless you're in the full Great Britain setup down in London you don't get paid for it. So I thought my best way of I love sport. I love teaching sport and I love working with young people. So I wanted to become a PE teacher. So after my, I did a sports science degree at Leeds University and then decided to go and do my teacher training. And um, that's when I went to Birmingham University. And during that year was the year that um, everything changed a bit slightly. And um, that was the year of London 2012. And I'll go on a bit of detail of how then that changed from being a hockey player to maybe trying out a couple of things. So that led me to what changed. I um, loved hockey, loved teaching and that was going to be my career. Um, however, a thing called um, London 2012 happened and I was watching, I was actually working at a kids camp in Cambridge and was watching the Paralympics and as I said before my, my foot, I'd never I'd never let it get in my way but there was loads, of, there was a few things that I couldn't do because of my foot and I was slightly stuck because of my foot and I didn't have any balance um, because of my foot but I kind of not ignored them, but I didn't see it as anything to hold me back and anything that I couldn't do, I found a way to overcome. And I think my body adapted a lot better through doing loads of sport with Talapis. And I think that that has given me where I am today, the opportunities that I've had. 
So I was literally watching London 2012 and it was a guy who was still on the team called Dan Greaves and he was throwing a discus. And as I say, my foot, if you see me walking down the street, it may be not so obvious, I may have a bit of a limp sometimes. However, to me, it's quite obvious I have a skinny ankle, I know what the ankle looks like. Um, and in a discus circle, they do a kind of zoom, zoom close up on, um, on your foot. And I literally saw him throwing discus and I went, I've got that foot. And it was literally from there that it changed everything. I thought, I love sport. Why have I not tried out Paralympic sport for? I had no idea that I was eligible to be in the Paralympics. And wow, this could be amazing. Um, it was quite scary because I then had this opportunity to go to um, a day called Sports Fest that was in Surrey that was after the Paralympics where you could just go and try out Paralympic sports, whether you had a disability or not, whether you wanted to compete at a high level or not. Um, and I was, it was really daunting. I was kind of thinking, oh, but I've got my identity, I'm a hockey player. Um, oh, I'm going to go from being an able-bodied hockey player to trying to be a disabled athlete. Um, but I've tried to not make my foot an issue and now it's becoming the reason why I'm doing these sports. But I still thought, I've got to give it a go. And my appetite for saying yes to things kind of dug through again. And um, I went to that sports fest in Guildford. I love all sports and I'd always loved athletics at school, but I was always kind of... I was always really fast, but I was always second or third. Whereas hockey, I was, I was getting better and better. Whereas athletics, I was, I was good, but against able-bodied people, I wasn't. I wasn't always the best, and I wasn't completely fastest. So, um, I still did it for fun, but I didn't pursue it as being a competitive sport. Whereas now, all of a sudden, I got this opportunity to try out athletics and be on a level playing field for people with similar disabilities to me, and it was an amazing opportunity. Um, I went to the sports fest, um, had a go. They got kind of watched by a few different coaches and they said we really think because you've been training for hockey you've already been training to get faster you could be really good at this and you've got a really op good opportunity uh, so it all went from there I got kind of fast tracked through to try out um, again have another little trial do some races you have to get a classification to compete um, which means you have to be checked by a doctor and a physio um, to put you in a category said so category that I mentioned earlier um, to then compete either in the UK or internationally there's two different classifications um, so that all happened very fast in the February and the March 2013 and then I got selected for my first world championship team um, for Great Britain in um, 2013 in the summer to go to Lyon in France and it was a huge opportunity and I had then had to make the decision whether to um, continue hockey or continue athletics and I love hockey and I will always go back to hockey and play it for fun and play it and in the team sport um hopefully into old age um but this again seemed like an opportunity i'd done a lot of things in hockey and i'd really went my way up and had a lot of opportunities and now this seems like the time to change over and do something um an individual sport which i could have complete control of so that it was a really good opportunity so kind of went from there um and again until this day i've had a, a really successful challenging athletics career at times i had a few injuries along the way but I've been to some amazing places I've been to be able to compete on the world stage and it's been absolutely fantastic. Okay, so following on, um, I mentioned I got into the um, athletics team and went to the world championships in uh, 2013. And from there I kind of worked and worked to get faster. I, from that moment, I then had a dream of um, becoming a Paralympian and getting to those Rio games. and. Um, I had some challenges along the way, but um, I'm proud to say now that I did make it there and I did get to the Paralympic Games. Um, but along the way, I had my first World Championships, as I mentioned, in Lyon. Um, and I just, the main aim each year was to get personal best, to get faster, and then to hopefully then challenge for medals in the future. Um, my second year in the sport, I went to the Europeans, excuse me, in Swansea, and got my first medal for Great Britain. And it was a huge proud moment. It was very windy and cold. It was a really hard race. But I got two bronze medals for Great Britain and it kind of instilled that belief that I could do it and that I could I could actually be successful in this and it was a huge, huge sense of achievement there. Um, moving forward, I then went to the World Championships in Doha in 2015. Um, I kind of got fast and fast and it was a real chance that um, I'd kind of been fifth in the world and I was working my way up to fourth and then it was a really good shout of a medal and I was getting faster and faster each time and I um, competed really well in warm conditions when we were out in Doha in Qatar 
I'd also been asked to be team captain, which was a huge honour, um, especially as an amazing, amazing team that we have in Great Britain. Um, and everything was going really well. Unfortunately, I was in the holding camp, it was a few days from competing, and I was just doing a normal practice in my start session, and I tore my hamstring uh, coming out of the blocks. And um, the medical team were fantastic, tried to get me back for um, the 200 meters. That wasn't gonna happen, but I managed to get on the start line for the 100 meters, convinced myself I was okay. Um, the gun went off and I took two steps and my hamstring just wasn't working. It, um, it was still torn, um, kind of jogged to the finish line and just stopped on the finish line, floods of tears, uh, just devastated that that dream of compete, um, competing on the world stage and challenging for a medal hadn't happened and so close to Rio as well. Um, and one key moment I actually remember from, from that day was everyone else would kind of run past the finish line as you do. Um, and it was actually the reigning champion from 2012 was the one person that turned around and saw me and she, um, like immediately ran back to help me um, and that was my one worry kind of going from team sport to an individual sport that you're kind of always out there on your own um, but actually I realised that there was you actually have a team behind the team but also my competitors um, I actually get on really well with most of my competitors and it was actually um, a really good sense of sportsmanship and camaraderie that she w was the one that came back and helped me and she didn't care that she'd run an amazing time and got to the final. Um, so it did show you it wasn't, it's not just kind of brutal on the start line and everyone wants to beat each other. Of course you want to beat each other, but um, it's that sense of sportsmanship and that we've all, all in it together a bit. So that was a good memory for me, um, apart from the torn hamstring and not making, not making it to the final. Um, but then moving on, I did, I had to, I had a really uphill battle from there, trying to rehab and get stronger but to get to Rio. Um, I left it quite late, um, but I'm proud to say I then got on that plane to Rio. I made the team and um, it was a huge opportunity for me and it kind of all seemed a bit surreal. Um, and then I actually, a lot of my heats and finals uh, were a bit of a blur from Rio. I had um, two rounds of the 100 metres and two rounds of the 200 metres. The 100 was the second event. Um, I don't really remember my 200 metres, but I got, I went into Rio ranked 8th um, in the 200 metres and 10th in the 100 on the world rankings. So for me to get through to the finals, to get into that top 8 was a huge, huge challenge. Um, but I wanted to do it and I knew I could run a personal best. I knew when it comes to the big stages and when I need to race, I love racing and I love competing. So um, 200 metres, I made it through to the final, ran a personal best and actually came 5th in the final, which was massive. So I beat people that were technically ranked ahead of me. Um, and then the 100 metres, again, it was a blur in the heats, ran a personal best, made it through to final by a couple of hundredths of a second. Um, but that one memory that stands out, when everyone asks me, kind of, what's your proudest achievement? I've, I've won kind of countless medals um, on European level. Um, and they're all really proud moments of mine. But actually, that standing on the start line of the 100 metre final, it was the last race of, um, on the track of the whole Paralympics. And I actually just stood there and I, it was the first time I was relaxed at the start of a race and nerves are good, nerves make me run faster but I just felt, I just looked around and went oh, I've done it, I've actually achieved what I wanted to achieve um, and then I ran the fastest I've ever run by quite a distance, um, beat the reigning champion, um, the girl that actually was the one that had helped me uh, the year before um, but came fifth um, again with a personal best so um, that's probably one of my proudest achievements of of just being that in that final and, and giving it my best and running a personal best and being in that atmosphere was absolutely fantastic. Moving forward, I'm still competing in athletics. I had a couple of years, I um, unfortunately got injured the year afterwards at the World Championships, um, but managed to compete there before I got injured. Uh, that was in London, so it was amazing to have a home crowd and be in the Olympic Stadium after watching the Paralympic Games. And I wasn't in those Paralympic Games at London, um, but, to then be in that and have be in that atmosphere and have British people shout at you. They didn't care if they knew who you were or not. They just saw that you had a Great Britain vest on and they screamed for you. Um, that was fantastic. And then moving on to European Championships was um, the last champs I've had for um, athletics um, and finished off with a couple of medals there and including a gold medal for the relay, which was the first ever um, mixed relay with different categories um, and male and female. So that. That, that topped off a pretty good season that year. Moving forward, I've still got my goals to, to get to Tokyo um, and challenge for more medals, get faster each year. My challenge is to, to 
beat my own personal best and get faster each year and then um, hopefully be out there and compete in those races and get competitive. But also along the lines of, of those goals, I mentioned that I um, compete in athletics and also para canoe now. So you might be wondering why um, I suddenly moved um, or added para canoe as such to sports. Um, as I mentioned in my category, I compete against people with legs affected below the knee. Um, so my um, disability, having talipiers and club foot, which led to my ankle being fused, um, is one of those disabilities, but it's also um, kind of dominated by athletes with amputations and that run with blades. And um, I kind of, we have been kind of um, given different category names now to say that there is a difference between the blades and people with my disability. However, we still compete together. And it did sometimes kind of felt a bit of an uphill uphill battle when you got faster and then, but then also technology got better. Um, which is power of sport that's within 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 the rules it's all fine um, and also people are getting better and stronger and ability to um, put power into the into the into the blades as well um, and at this time a couple of, uh, 18 months ago I had um, para canoe approach me and say um, we know what your disability your fused ankle and we're looking for someone in your category would you like to try it out um, again my appetite for saying yes to opportunities kind of took fold and um, I also love outdoor sports. As I mentioned before, I love trying out all different sports. Um, when I go on holiday, I've been in a sea kayak, which is different to a racing kayak, but I knew I'd enjoy it, um, but I thought I'd give it a go. Why not? Um, I actually loved it a lot, even more than I thought I would. Um, and I also got better a lot quicker than I thought I would. I kind of started at around 72 seconds um, I think was my first time I did for 200 meters in a kayak um, to be competitive you've got to be under about 50 seconds um, on the world stage in in the kayak so I had quite a lot of chunk to take off but actually over over about six months so I did I gained the technique and I, I understood it and again it's similar to when I started hockey I just I like to learn and I like to improve on the technique and I'm, I got better than expected a bit quicker than expected so I had my first international um, vest last year I went to the Europeans um, and the World Cup I had a testing race and a bit wavy on the on the course in um, Poland and nearly fell in but managed to grab myself um, a bronze medal um, and then got myself selected for the world championships for Great Britain and um, came away from sil with a silver medal in, in Hungary and again a personal best so I couldn't have been happier so I now have a bit of a bit of a challenge in my mind of doing the two sports I'm trying to combine the two sports um the sway has gone slightly over to to para canoe because I got a world medal in it um but I'm really enjoying it I'm really hoping to get faster in it and um well we were supposed to hopefully be going to first selection in a month or so but the coronavirus has um taken priority and people's health and safety has taken priority so the paralympics have been moved to next year and um, so we'll be going back into kind of heavier training winter training um sooner than expected and hopefully those same goals to get fast to get stronger um, and then we'll um, assess getting faster next year to um to get selected then hopefully um but fingers crossed so finally as i've, as I've mentioned uh, my goals are still the same i want to go to tokyo get on that plane and challenge for some medals for um, the paralympics gb team i might have to wait a little bit longer and it's quite frustrating than having to change training but it is uh for safety of everyone uh, you guys at home um I say I normally do school visits and come into your schools, uh, but this is a new way of doing it, a bit of virtual um, training. So I'm going to hopefully give you some ideas of games that um, you can do either on your own or with um, your siblings or your family that you're in your um, social isolation with. Um, and hopefully they will be fun, but also they will hopefully develop some skills that will help you within whatever hobbies or sports you want to competing or do for fun so we're going to start with a few different exercises a few different warm-up exercises and then we'll move into some specifics um, mainly athletics because I'm aware that um, canoe might not be quite as accessible to find a boat um, but hopefully get you moving get you strong get you through some of those fundamentals of movement and have a lot of fun along the way exercise we're going to go through 
is uh, we just want to get the heart rate up. Um, so we're going to start with a bit of jogging on the spot and then I'm going to go through some commands that you've got to do as quickly as possible. So doing them as quickly as possible helps you with your reaction time, which is really key with sprinting. Um, and also the exercises will help you with um, different elements as well. So action number one, if I shout jump in the air, you're going to jump as high as you can up in the air. Number two, if I shout touch the floor, you're going to squat down, touch the floor as quickly as you can. Uh, using those legs muscles nice and straight. Try not to bend over straight, use your back, try and bend legs, touch the floor. Third one is going to be stand on one leg. So stand on one leg as quickly as you can, get your balance point, try and hold your arms out if it helps you. If you're really challenging yourself and you're really good at it, then try to shut your eyes, makes it a little bit harder. And then the fourth one is spin around. So if I set up spin around, you're going to spin as quickly as you can and then carry on moving. Okay, so you're going to start by jogging on the spot, try and get your heart rate moving, keep your arms pumping and then you're going to keep moving. You can move around, you don't have to stand still, you can jog around in circles, move about. If you're doing it with your brothers and sisters, mums and dads, you can move around the garden, try to bump into each other, keep moving. We're going to say jump in the air, jump as quickly as you can, keep jogging, touch the floor, then keep jogging. So jump in the air, I might shout, spin around. I shout, jump in there, touch the floor. Jump in there, touch the floor, keep jogging. All right, so stand on one leg. Go stand, hold it, keep your breath, and then keep jogging. Jump in there, touch the floor, keep jogging. Spin around, try not to bump into each other if you're running around. Jump on the floor. Touch the floor, not jump on the floor. Jump in the air, spin around, touch the floor, jump in the air, keep moving. Now try and get your feet moving a bit faster. So fast feet, fast feet, fast feet. Spin around, jump in the air, touch the floor. On one leg. Ooh. And hold it there. Hopefully your heart rate should be up a bit. You can keep going for as long as you want. You can do it in a group and okay. get moving. Okay, so the next warm up exercise is also a good game that so you can either do on your own um, or try and find a partner or if your parents or your siblings want to get involved, then it's a really good game to challenge yourselves against each other. So it's called heads, shoulders, knees and cones. Now, I don't have any cones at home, so I've got flower pots, but you can use whatever you like. Anything that rhymes with cones, you could use your phones, you could just got any scones, um, anything you want that you can grab any piece of cutlery whatever you want um, so the idea is I'm going to give, show you the version to you first on your own so I'm going to set out a few cones you can use one you can use two three or four this is a good version to do on your own if you're doing it with partner you only need one okay so I'm gonna start with um you need someone to shout out the command so either a parent or somebody else I'm gonna have said my husband who's behind the camera shout out so you just listen to the command so they say head touch your heads shoulders you touch shoulders knees you bend down so squat down using your hamstrings and your glutes and they can say toes you can touch your toes but what they can say is they can shout cones or phone or scones whatever you use okay so when you have to react as quickly as you can and I'm doing it on my own so I have four Cones, and I'm going to try and pick them all up as quickly as I can when they shout it. So, take it away. Heads, toes, knees, heads, shoulders, cone. Got them. Okay, round two. The idea is to get as quickly as possible, get nice and low, and have a quick reaction time. When you're sprinting and the mark starter says on your marks, get set, go, you've got to react as quickly as possible. Okay? Round two. Toes, heads, toes, heads, knees, shoulders, toes, heads, heads, toes, knees, shoulders, heads, cones. <laughs> okay, so that is how you do it on your own. Two is with a partner and whoever's in your household and you only need one cone, bone, bone, whatever you're using. I've got my flower pot here my trusty partner and so if there's somebody else that can shout the commands that's great so if your parents nearby but if not you can swap over and take it in turns so you're not cheating of who says the commands so i'm going to start first 
Round one. Heads, shoulders, knees, toes, knees, shoulders, heads, shoulders, knees, shoulders, heads, games. <laughs> one point to me. Try not to cheat. If you're going to say cones, don't go and grab it before you do it. You've got to say it and then go. Round two. Here we go, Tom. Heads, knees, toes, 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 heads, shoulders, toes, heads, knees, toes, heads, cones. <laughs> <laughs> what on? Okay, we're going to do the decider and then you can have a go. Heads, shoulders. Knees, shoulders, coat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even listen to it to myself. And so on and so forth. Have a challenge okay, so between yourself. Number three. This is another one to have if you've got a partner. You don't need anyone to shout commands or give you ideas. Um, the idea is, it needs to be a nice low squat position. So switch our glutes on and our quads and our hamstrings. And the idea is, go for about 30 seconds. You can set a timer or just in case you get really tired. So race against each other. The idea is that you're supposed to tap the knees of your opponent. So you ready? Oh, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Go! and the neighbours to, um, to referee over the fence so that could be an idea as well. Really good warm up game, gets your heart rate moving but also gets your muscles working. Give it a go. Okay so hopefully you're nice and warm, you've done some games. Um, I'm just going to go through some kind of athletics related drills that you can do in your garden, in your living room, um, in, a, in the small space and then I'll also add on some later that you can do if you've got a large garden or you've got access to um, go and exercise outside. So first things first for the with athletic with sprinting with my discipline is you want to be powerful and you want to be strong in those positions so the key position for when you're running when you're upright running is a high knee drive okay so if we run with our knees really low then we don't get as long a stride length we want our stride every stride to be as powerful off the floor so it makes it as long as possible so when we are running we want to be at right angles with it all of our joints, okay? So, right angle, edge of a square. My arms are gonna be at a right angle. I don't pump my arms straight. I pump my arms backwards and forwards from the shoulder. So I keep my elbow at a right angle and I let it swing from the shoulder. Whatever your arms do, your legs copy. So if my arms are kind of really lazy and they don't move very fast, then my legs are gonna do the same. But if my arms move really fast, really nice and pumping, then my legs do the same, okay? So, upright running start. Arms at a right angle, also our knees and uh, ankles at a right angle. Mine's easy on this leg because this is the one that's fused. On this leg though, my foot tends to drop a bit. I want to make sure my toes are pointing up. So when I hit the floor, I hit the floor and I react off the floor nice and quickly. Okay? If my toes are pointed, I kind of bounce off the floor and I have a lot more longer time on the floor, my foot in contact with the floor. Idea of running and sprinting, you want as quick contact off the floor as possible. Okay, so what we're gonna do first, we're just gonna do a high knees drill. So you're just gonna start jogging the spot normally, but then I want to start pumping the arms and knees. So at right angles, try and get as quickly off the floor as possible. And you keep going, pump the arms and the knees, at least 15 seconds, and then relax. You can repeat this a few times over and over again. No, I try and stay nice and tall. I try and switch my core muscles on. If I lean forward, I'm not going to be able to get my knees as high. And also if I lean backwards, it's going to hurt my back. And also I'm going to start reaching outwards and I'm going to hurt my legs and I'm going to hit the floor with my foot going in that direction. So that's acting as a break. So if I stay nice and tall, my shoulders and my hips in line, then when I hit the floor, hit the floor underneath me and I get to propel myself forwards. So give that one a go first. And secondly, we're going to bring back into 
when we did our warm up, we had a bit of a balance ex exercise, stopping on one leg. So you're gonna go in threes and practice balancing, but also your high knees. So you're gonna start on one leg. I'm cheating, I'm going on my easy leg to balance, but I will swap over. And then you're gonna pump three times, one, two, three, and stop on that leg. And hold it for a couple of seconds. And hold. Okay, so do those two go first. Really good ones to do on the spot. Try and do them for at least 15, 20 seconds or count and do it 10 times each side and then repeat three or four on. times each. Yeah. Okay, so to add on to, um, to of your technique is also when I mentioned before, speed and power are really key elements of sprinting. Also, they're really relevant in my hiking as well. It's all about speed, it's all about power, it's all about force production. So really, really good practice and fun games you can do at home. Simply jumps. So jumping is reacting off the floor and trying to jump as high as you can. Really gets those muscles in your legs firing and it gets them to react quickly and it gets them to get strong. Okay, so a few different jump variations you can do. So double footed jump, all you're gonna do so up with your feet about shoulder width apart. You want to squat down, you don't want to lean forward. You're going to squat down, imagine you're like a spring and you're going to spring up out in the air. And when we come to doing looking a bit of blocks later, coming out of blocks and the starting blocks, I'm going to talk about being that spring. You're going to be a nice coiled spring and then when the starter says go, you're going to explode out and let that spring go out of the blocks. So you coil up your spring, you let your knees bend, and then jump up as high as you can. Okay, you're going to repeat that a few times. So a simpler way of doing it, did you stop, then bend down again, jump up, and then land, and then again, squat, jump up, land, stand up. If you want to develop it and get, challenge yourself a bit more, if you want to react off the floor. So when I talked about that contact time off the floor, we're going to try and jump as quickly off the floor again, repeatedly. So you're going to do 10 in a row. You go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, and stop. Okay. As you see there, I was also bending my knees, so it's going to be a little bit longer time on the floor. We're going to come to reactive ones later that will help you get even quicker off the floor um, and more explosiveness. Another good way to practice jumping is single leg. So when you're running, you're one leg on the floor at a time. So you're going to practice hopping. If you can do it on the spot, or if you've got more room, you can hop forwards, backwards, left, and right. Okay, so I'm just going to do the spot. Start on one leg. Hop in the air and land. Try and land and balance rather than put your other leg down. If you're finding it hard to balance, start on one leg, jump up in the air and land on two feet. Start on one leg, jump up in the air and land on two feet. And repeat that again and again. Third thing we're going to do, as I mentioned, we've practiced squatting with a leg, jumping up in the air, is practicing reactive ones. So this time we're not going to bend our knees so much. It's going to be working at our lower feet. Now, as I mentioned before, I don't have any ankle movements, so my glutes have to work harder on my left hand side. So I don't get as much height on this side because my ankle doesn't give me any propulsion. So I'm going to try and not let my right leg take over and try and get them both in even. So you're going to start on the floor and you're going to jump up and down, but you're going to try and keep the knees just, just slightly soft. So you don't want them straight and locked out, slightly soft, but you're not going to let them bend too much. So as you jump up and down, you react off the floor. And do 10 of those. And stop. So that's reactive, really good for your ankles, really good for foot placement. In athletics, that's how you're going to get more power off the floor, get a quick reaction time on the floor. So take your time, give them all a go, challenge yourselves. You can do standing four jumps, try and jump as far as you can, as high as you can, and give it a good practice. Okay, so I'm going to go into a little bit of technical about um, athletics. We've done some jump drills, some power drills to get us nice and warm. And um, I'm going to talk you through uh, how to do a um, perfect sprint start, basic sprint start that you can do without blocks. Um, that will help you get nice and powerful acceleration into your race. If you have a small area, obviously you probably can't, do a sprint start and run. So I'm just going to demonstrate it. I'm not going to run out of uh, my start, but I'll just demonstrate the start. And then if you have access to a big garden or you go outside to do your activity, then you can really give it a go and unleash, uh, let unleash your speed. So I'm going to have, give myself a start line. So I'm going to use my trusty 
flower pot. This is going to be my start line. My lane is going into the fence. So, I mentioned earlier, you want to be like a coiled spring. So you want to be nice and bent knees, ready to explode out the blocks. Really common conception is when I ask people to show me what the perfect sprint start looks like, loads of people go, yeah, like that. Now, that's quite good. My front leg's nice and bent, but my left leg is straight. So there's no way I can get any push through my knee to go out of those blocks. So I want to be nice and tight. So what you'd like to do to get a good distance behind the line, we don't want to start with our hand, with our feet on the line next to our hands. Because the idea of sprint start is you start low so you can accelerate forwards. You don't want to stand up, you want to accelerate forwards. And acceleration gets faster and faster and faster throughout those blocks. Whereas if I start on my feet next to my hands, when the starter says go, I'm also actually just going to stand up. So I want my feet to be behind my hands and my hands need to be behind the line. So an easy way to measure that is you put one of your feet touching the line, doesn't matter which one, and then you draw an L shape or a backwards L shape, depending on how you do it, behind it, and then you step behind that L. So it's quite easy, so one foot, fit an L shape, and then your front foot, come and bring it behind that foot you're going to get the L with. So it should be about a foot and a half of yours behind the line. And then you're going to drop down your knee to the floor, and for me, I have my knee next to my toe. Okay, if you're too far behind, then you say when you go into that set position, you're not going to get your coiled spring effect. So, the foot the knee is next to your toe. You then, this is my imaginary line with my cones, you just bring your hands forward to roughly where that line is, so you're probably about a foot behind the line. And you can either have your hands flat on the floor or upright, whichever is more comfortable, but have your fingers facing outwards and your thumbs facing inwards. Okay, if they're forwards, then my wrists are not going to let me to go forwards. So, I've got my fingers facing outwards, my thumbs face forwards. And again, I don't want to be leaning backwards because when the starter says go, I need to be going forwards. So I then want to bring my weight slightly forward over my fingertips. So if someone let go of my hands all of a sudden, I'd fall on the floor. So I want them nicely poised. Then when the starter says set, all you're going to do is bring your bum up a little bit off the floor. You don't need to be straight. Again, knees don't need to be straight. You just need to be off the floor, nice straight back and your weight is on those hands again, you'd fall over, you let go of them. And then all you do is when they say go, is you're gonna spring forwards and push with that leg that's at the front. Doesn't matter which leg's at the front, just whichever one's comfortable for you. And um, give that a go. I'll repeat it one more time. So you create an L shape, step behind it, then you bring your knee next to your toe, bring your hands forwards, fingers facing outwards. When the starter says set, you bring that spring slightly open so it's ready to go and then go you push forwards and come out the blocks so go and give it a go okay so it's challenge time i've got four challenges for you give them a go you can try them over and over again try and improve your personal best in them challenge number one i mentioned about contact time on the floor being as quickly as possible so when we do some of you that might have done gymnasts or um different mpe you might talk about contact points. At the moment, I have two contact points on the floor. When you are walking, you always have two contact points on the floor. So my, I always have, at one point, there's gonna be two feet on the floor and one on the floor. There's never a point where there's none on the floor. The difference between walking and running is running, there's a bit of flight time. So when I change from one foot to the other, there's time in the air where there is no points of contact on the floor, okay? If I put my hands on the floor, four points of contact on the floor. So your challenge is in whatever way possible, whether you're inside or outside, it can be to get from one side of the room or the garden to another with as little points of contact as possible. Okay, so I'm gonna try and get from one end of the grass to the other end of the grass with a few points of contact as possible. And then try and get as explosive as you can, get them as quickly as possible. So my attempt one, I'm gonna try and jump. So. Ready. One, two, three. So, three jumps. All of my jumps were with two points of contact. So that adds up to six. So, I need to try and beat six points of contact. So that's three jumps, but both with two feet. So that's three, lots of two, six. So that's what I'm gonna beat. I'm gonna give it a hopping. So hopping is just one point of contact. A little bit more challenging, and I'll give it a go. Ready.
three. Three jumps have gone one side to the other, and um, I made my score from six down to three. Half my score, loads better, loads more challenging. I might give it a go on the other leg in a minute. Give it a go, whether it's in your garden, in your room, try and get from one side to the other, being safe, don't crash into things, um, with as little points of contact on the floor as possible. Okay, challenge number two. Nice and simple, you can do this inside or outside, you can compete with other people or compete with yourself, it's up to you, or just have a bit of fun with it. Simple as it says on the tin, you're gonna balance on one leg for as long as you can. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if standing on one leg is quite easy for you, maybe try and shut your eyes. You get someone to time it for you, or you can just count in your head, and you go for as long as possible. And then if you want a challenge, I've got quite good balance on my right leg, my left leg, the one with my fused ankle, I can't get a good balance, so I'm going to try and challenge myself on my left leg and stand on one leg for as long as possible. And each time, I'm going to try and get better. I'm going to try and beat my own score. Don't worry about what other people do. You can have a bit of fun with it. Try and beat your score. Give it a go. Okay, challenge number three. We're going to practice a bit that we use in the warm up about squatting low, but also we're going to add a bit of changing direction, a bit of speed in it as well. I have got my four improvised cones but they can be any objects you like and I've set them out in set distances they can be again wherever you like inside outside as far apart as little apart you just want them to be in the same place each time so I've got cone number one at the start of my lawn cone number two in the middle cone number three at the end of my lawn and cone number four at the end of my patio so aim is is you have to go and collect each cone one at a time and then you have to replace them back one at a time. You do it in the quickest time. So you try and get someone to time you, or again, count in your head or get someone to count. And um, you're gonna try and beat that score each time. So here is my attempt. I'm gonna start, this is gonna be my line on the patio, it's gonna be my start line. So Tom, if you can give me a ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. You gotta collect it, you gotta bring it back to your lap. Collect the cane, bring it back to the line. Bring it back to the line. Collect the jelly. Bring it back to the line. And then I'm collecting again the furthest one first. Back to the line. Give it a go. You can move the cones further apart. You can add more cones. Make it more challenging. Challenge each other. What thing is to get low to get the cones, change the direction, really get those muscles working, get that change of speed each time you turn direction. So let us okay, know how so it goes. Challenge number four is the standing long jump test. So it's really good to test your power and how springy those muscles can be um, on a one-off jump. So you do this inside or outside, you just need to make sure there's enough space so you're not gonna jump into anything. You also, I have a tape measure here, but you don't need a tape measure. All you need is something to mark your jump with. Again, come back to my trusty cones. So, you want yourself a start line, doesn't matter where it is, just the same place you're gonna jump from each time. You wanna start with your toes <coughs> behind the line. So you're gonna jump, you're gonna jump as far as you can. You wanna bend your knees, and you also wanna use your arms to propel yourselves forward. Okay, so as I jump, I wanna spring forward and lift my arms up in the air, as if I was doing a long jump, your arms are filling up in the air to get that height, okay? You're then going to place the cone behind your heels where you land. So in a long jump, that would be where you land in the sound bed. So I'm going to have a couple of attempts and let's see how it goes. So number one. Right, try and land with both feet next to each other. I'm going to put my cone down in line with my heels. If you land one foot in front of the other, you have to take the marker from the back heels. So try and land two feet next to each other, try not to fall backwards, because then you have to measure it behind you. So that's my attempt one, put my cane there, and I'm gonna give it another go, try and beat my person best. Okay, attempt number two. Ah, <sighs> <sighs> oh, that was better. Yeah, got a bit more spring there, use my arm a bit more. Okay, move my cane forwards, and I've got so nearly two metres, about 195, but don't need to measure it at all. You can just have the phone, you can move it about, and um, let me know how you get on.